In the world, people are constantly talking about the ladder of, ladder of what? Success. We should always be trying to climb the ladder of success. What if the ladder of success is taking you to the wrong plateau? What if you work so hard to set up the ladder and climb the ladder. Imagine you're at home trying to change a light bulb, but you, you realize that that light bulb actually works. And it was another light bulb that doesn't work. You took out the ladder from your garage, you set it up, you got nervous, but you did it anyways. Then you get to the top and it's working. You would think that would be such a waste. I should have paid more attention. What if we've been doing that our whole lives in this ladder of success, when our idea of success is not bringing what success should bring, what should success bring? Peace. Without peace, how valuable is success? With peace, any experience, any emotion becomes valuable. Through our study of Bhagavad Gita and Ramayana, or Ramayana and Bhagavad Gita, we are highlighting the danger of aviveka. When you're on a cruise ship, before that ship moves, what do they have? They have that drill, right? Everyone has to put their jacket on. This is the boat you're assigned to. Before they take off on a plane, they also have the dangers of, you know, having your bag in the aisle or being in the bathroom when there's a crisis. Through our study, what is being highlighted is the dangers of aviveka. And very simply, aviveka is living a life of misprioritization. Not knowing what is important is aviveka. And we tell our kids that all the time. Don't you know what's important? They should look at us and say, don't you know what's important? This course is about alignment. The Sanskrit word for alignment could be dharma, that which integrates. It could be vivaha, that which nourishes. We're trying to align what we need with what we're doing. Many times we need this, but we're not doing that which brings what we need. In our class last week, we studied how Ravana is making all beings suffer. He's making his father suffer and his wife suffer, and he's making the people around him suffer. He's making people far away from him suffer. The whole world is suffering because of Ravana. He is sending his family to go and stop all yajna, all the karma, all the rituals that are happening, He's saying, go and destroy that if it's happening. Prevent it if it's going to happen. All yajna should end. And Goswamiji says, he's making all beings depend on him. Whether it's safety, whether it's prosperity, everyone has to depend on Ravana. So this is what's shared literally but whenever we study that which is literal, we also have to study the implied meaning or the subjective meaning. This is, a, this is history. How does this relate to us? Now, please pay attention. This word Ravana means the one who roars is Ravana. He's always roaring at others. What does Ravana sound like 
It's another Vedantic word that we keep saying, make sure you practice this. Shravana. Shravana means to listen. Listen mindfully, listen carefully. Ravana is always roaring. He's not listening. You and I are like Ravana too, correct? Always roaring at each other instead of listening to each other. Roaring at life instead of listening to life. <laughs> so don't think Ravana li lived in Lanka. Ravana also lives in Brexville and Solon <laughs> and all the other cities we live in. No yagna. Ravana stopping all yagna. Yesterday I was mentioning, what is the English word for yagna? Any of you were there, <laughs> were there yesterday? What is the English word for yagna? The sacrifice only comes if there's dedication. So no yagna. When Ravana stops yagna, for us, it's when we don't live a life of dedication. When we're not dedicated to our health, we're not dedicated to our family, to our community, we've stopped yagna. We always think of yagna as a fire sacrifice. So Ravana stopping that. But if you have difficulties waking up in the morning because there's no purpose, you've also stopped yagna. If the best in you is not being brought out, you've also stopped yagna. And Ravana is making everyone dependent on him, yes? But the whole point of Sanatana Dharma is to make us independent. Swatantra. That we should depend on no one but ourselves. In chapter 2 of Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Acharya Shankara says, Ishwaropi, which means even God, is dependent on the self. Is the self dependent on God? No. But God is dependent on, on the self. This is what we're trying to realize. On page 129, and it'll be too difficult to tell you what portion this is, what Goswamiji shares, please listen, he says, the number of villains, thieves, and gamblers, and of those who coveted others' wealth and wives swelled to a great extent. People honored not their parents and gods, but exacted service from pious souls. Those who act in this way, Bhavani, Bhagavan Shiva is talking to Mother Parvati, know all such creatures as demons. This supreme disrespect for religion is extremely alarming and perturbing. Are there more villains <laughs> in society right now? Are there more thieves? Are there more gamblers? And outwardly they may look very pleasant, but the way people think, isn't it? Those who covet other people's wealth, wives, you see? Possession, you see? Pleasure. People who treat those who are living a life of peace as workers, that we should control them rather than serve them. Disrespect for religion. No regard or remembrance of one's parents. That's when Ravana rules. And I'm bringing some of this out just to show us how relevant what we're studying is. I'm not a teacher of fear or to make us feel bad. And if you are interpreting it that way, please don't. I'm only trying to bring out the relevance of this is happening. And so we need Bhagavan Rama to come and help us. And today's the day that Bhagavan Rama comes and helps us. But before we get there, I'm on the 185th section of Chopais. I'm reading the third Chopai, the first line. I'm on page 130. So is that section 185? Third Chopai, first line. Goswamiji shares. Hari Vyapaka Sarvatra Samana. Premate pragata hoihu me jana. And I'll explain what this means. Right now, earth has taken the form of a cow. Bhumi 
has disguised herself as a girl. And she's gone to this assemblage of devatas, where Lord Brahma is there, where Lord Shiva is there, and she's shaking, she's crying. If you ever have witnessed, you know, a child who's in great fear, you know, they, they shake, they cry. Mother Earth is feeling this because of what's happening, which I just described. So she goes to where all of these gods are assembled and they're trying to figure out what do we do? Ravana is overpowering us also. But Bhagavan Shiva says here, Hari Vyapaka Sarvatra Samana. All of you should know that Bhagavan Hari is ever present. He is ever present. present. Prema te pragata hohi me jana. You should all know that Hari will manifest where there is prema. So really he's asking all of those people assembly, do you love Hari? Do you love Bhagavan enough to feel Bhagavan? He's putting that onus on them. It's very easy to beg. But he's saying, do you want, do you need Bhagavan Hari? And Bhagavan Shiva says he's available. Swami Tejumayananda always shares, Bhagavan is not looking at our ability, he's looking for our availability. If you can speak well or not speak well is irrelevant. If you know Sanskrit or don't know Sanskrit, irrelevant. But do you love Bhagavan? Do you love self-development? And all of the people that have assembled in front of Bhagavan Vishnu, they all feel Dina. Oh, we just chanted Dina Bandhu, correct? <coughs> As all of these Dina, all of these helpless beings gather in front of Bhagavan Vishnu, what Bhagavan Vishnu shares, he says, <coughs> Nirbhaya Hohu. He's saying to all of those beings, be Bhaya, bhaya means be afraid, but nirbhaya, stop being afraid. In other words, he's given them his promise that he is going to come and help them. He's going to come to earth who is feeling this pain. He is going to come and support her. So here too, so many of us in so many cities, Bhagavan Vishnu is telling you, nirbhaya ho. And just think to yourself, imagine you can live a life without worry. Our whole life would change, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it? Imagine we can live without fear. It'd be like we're in Canada. Nirbhaya <laughs> hohu. <laughs> and when Bhagavan Vishnu says this, the relief on Mother Earth, the relief on those devatas, the relief on those people, connected to, the, to those devatas, that's all described. People go home and they, they feel at rest. When you've traveled, 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 and then you just are able to rest. That's such a feeling you crave. And all of these beings felt that rest. They celebrated. When Prince Arjuna shares to Bhagavan Krishna that I am your Shishya, what does Bhagavan Krishna do? He smiles at him. And many commentators interpret that like he's being sarcastic, like, why are you crying? You know, in a very mean way. When in actuality, Bhagavan Krishna is smiling to relieve those tears of Prince Arjuna that everything's okay. You will be fine. And that's what happens, correct? So here too, Bhagavan Vishnu shares this message and everyone internalizes that. So I've told you the history, now I tell you your story. I'll make this subjective, okay? Bhagavan Rama is you. You may not know that, but you are Bhagavan Rama. Your nature is Ananda, correct? Ramyate means the one who revels in joy. That's your nature. And just because you've forgotten your nature doesn't mean your nature has changed. 
I may not use the word truth, but the truth never changes, right? Someone says satyam, someone says something else, but it's still the truth. Bhagavan Rama is you, and when you engage in sadhana, you begin to feel that joy. When you follow disciplines, when you bring meaning into your responsibilities, whatever your idea of sadhana is. Today I met a little girl and she said, my japa is in my car. And I didn't understand what she was saying. And she says, you know, I sit in the car and I chant Sri Ram, Jai Ram, Jai Jai Ram. And I said, it's not your japa, it's your japa mala that's in your car. But what difference does it make? She can call it japa, she can call it water bottle, who cares? But you see, when she's sitting in this car, Bhagavan Rama is becoming more real to her, isn't it? Today someone was asking me, when did I get exposed to Swami Chinmayananda? And I said, I was in high school. We didn't have an ashram or teachers because Niagara Falls is so small. Even now it's so small. And so all of the younger people, I'm in Cleveland right now, so many young people here and in all of your cities and centers, they're way ahead of the game, correct? All of us with white hair, now we're studying <laughs> self-development. Some of these kids were born into self-development. What a blessing on them. Sadhana is when you transport yourself from Fairfield or Portland or Niagara Falls and you go to Vaikuntha. Who lives in Vaikuntha? Bhagavan Vishnu. But I had explained to you, Kuntita means sharp. Where ego is sharpest, that's Kuntita. That's where we always are. When you put that prefix V, it means bluntness. So no sharpness, bluntness. When your ego becomes blunt, in other words, it's no longer hurting you, that's Vaikuntha. When we engage in sadhana, we become less ego, more enlightened, correct? And if you just keep doing sadhana, you finally establish yourself in, in enlightenment. So when Bhagavan Shiva says, Hari is at all pervading, do you believe that? Do you have faith in that? Dina. When I say Dina, and I use the word helpless, what comes to your mind? Think. Who's Dina? Someone who's afraid, yes? someone who is a bhakta. We don't have very, typically, we don't have very strong notions of dina. Nobody wants to be dina. Like if I said, on your resume you wrote helpless, please hire, hire me. Right? Do you write that word help, helpless? You don't want someone who's helpless in your corporation or your, or your ashram. But if you make this subjective, someone who's dina, they know that the ego is helpless. The ego will not make one peaceful. That's what Dina is. So we use the word Bhakta, but this Bhakta knows a whole lot. They're not tricked by the world. They know being egotistical will not relieve them of suffering. That they have to relieve them, themselves of the ego to be able to relieve that suffering. The ego cannot help us. The ego is always engaged in vada. Vada means killing. Vada means violence. Who does the ego hurt the most? Yourself, isn't it? Forget about other people, ourselves. Avada means no killing, no violence. Avada in Audi Basha means ayodhya. Ayodhya is that place where there is no killing, there is no violence. So where is Ayodhya? It is a place in Bharat, but Ayodhya should also be ourselves. It should be our personality. And Swami Tejramayananda had shared, people who are Balahina, what does Bala mean? Strong. Balahina, people who are weak. People who are weak always allow themselves to attack themselves. 
like a weak driver, as they're pulling into their garage, they'll hit their garage side of their garage, they'll hit the other car. Who owns all of that? They own all of that. <laughs> Whose insurance is gonna go up? Their insurance is gonna go up. I didn't mean anything personal <laughs> against anyone, but you get my point, right? If I drive a car and I hit my own car, then I allowed that to happen. Balahina allows themselves to attack themselves. Those who are weak also allow others to attack themselves. You know, this subject is very straightforward, isn't it? We're told that we don't have purpose in life. We're told we're dependent. And sometimes people take this very personally. And those people who take it very personally without sadhana, they don't come back. Those people who take it very personally and come back, it's because it applies to those people and they know it. They're being honest. And they're ready to face that heat and change. Those people who leave, it's because they want to surround themselves by fools to keep making themselves feel good. Those people want to keep living a life of dependency. They're stuck. Don't be balahina. And if someone comes and attacks you, if you take it personally, it's because you're weak. Make yourself strong. Okay? Especially if it's coming from someone who's wise. What, what can you give a wise person? Nothing. So why do they say what they say? For you, not for them. Isn't it? And I was sharing that the city rejoiced, the world rejoiced when Bhagavan Rama said Nirbhaya. And the people who shun the most were his mothers. Mother Koshalya, Mother KK, Mother Sumitra, they were shining as if their garba was not filled with Bhagavan, but filled with Hiranya. With gold they were shining. What this means is, and I had shared, KK symbolizes karma. Sumitra symbolizes bhakti. And kaushalya symbolizes jnana. When you have selflessness and you have devotion and you have knowledge in your life, you shine. Your light you understand first, and then you can help other people with their light. See, we take this literally that when you're pregnant, you shine. It could be sweat. It could be nausea. <laughs> but what if you're a male? What if you can't have children? What if you don't want to have children? Does that mean I can't shine then? See, that's that interpretation of separation. This is teaching us we can all live a life of karma, bhakti, and, and jnana. If we want to bring Bhagavan Rama into our life, we need to have prema love. And Swami Tejumayananda had shared, devotion is of the nature of renunciation. Please try to remember that teaching. Devotion is of the nature of renunciation. If you love X, that means you have to let go of Y. You have to give, take more from Y. Whatever you're giving to Y, you have to give more to X, correct? If you love peace, you cannot get lost in pleasure. So many of us were indulgent but also practice discipline. Is it possible? You can say you're disciplined, but are you disciplined? It requires that honesty. Devotion is of the nature of renunciation, and it's so natural. If you have a purpose to wake up for in the morning, do you even need an alarm clock? You renounce that alarm clock. We are renounced waking up. We should renounce <laughs> that alarm clock, isn't it? When there's karma, bhakti, jnana, it happens naturally. Are you ready? Okay. Now that we've practiced our devotion, we are letting go of pleasure and possession and position, and we want peace to be born, peace will be born. I'm going to read the 186th section of Chopra. No, no, sorry, wrong one. 
I'm going to read the 192nd section of Chopais. You should make a note of that because this is where Bhagavan Rama is born. Whenever you begin that which is new, a new home, a new job, that which is new, you want peace to be there, remember this section. You should read this section in that place. Okay? I'm on the 192nd section of Chopais. I'm going to read all of the Chopais. I'm on page 135 in my book. You know how long it took us to finally have Bhagavan Rama born? It's like real labor. 10 hours. We've been studying for 10 hours or almost 15 classes to reach 600 minutes before Bhagavan Rama is born. And I started teaching this in another center, but they didn't have the patience to last this long. So Bhagavan Rama was never born in that center. <laughs> but all of you have had the patience for this to be here. Fairfield got lucky. They just came right at the end <laughs> for the birth. They're very efficient, business-minded people <laughs> in uh, Connecticut. If you have the text, please read along with me. If you don't have the text, I would really like for you to close your eyes. And I would li like for you to feel, you being Bhagavan Rama, feel that joy of, of knowing what your potential is. And if all of that is too deep and abstract, just think about how your life has changed since karma and or bhakti and or jnana has come into your life. Okay? So you're reading with me or your eyes are closed. And feel. I'll read nice and slow. Bhai Pragata Kripala Dina Dayala Kausalya Hitakari Harashita Mahatari Muni Manahari Adbhuta Rupa Vichari Lochana Abhirama Tanugana Syama Nija ayudha bhuja chari Bhushana vana mala nayana visala Sobha sindha karari Kahadui karajori Astuti tori Kehi bidi karau ananta Maya guna jnana tita amana Beda Purana Bananta Karuna Sukha Sagar Sabaguna Agar Jehi Gava Hishuti Santa So Mama Hita Lagi Jana Anuragi Baya Upragata Shri Kanta Brahmanda Nikaya Nirmita Maya Roma Roma Prati Beda Kahi Mama ura so basi yaha upahasi sunata dhira mati stira narahi upajaja bhagyana prabhu susukana charita bahuta bidi kina chahe kahi kata kata sohai matu bujai jahi prakara sutta prema lahi mata puni boli so mati dholi tajahutata yaharupa ki jai sisulila ati priya sila yahasuka parama anupa suni bachana sujana rodana thana hoi balaka su surabhupa yaha charita je gavai hari pada pavahi Tena parahi bhu bhava kupa Bipradenu sura santa hita Lina manuja avatara Nija icha nir mitatanu Maya guna so parasiyavara rama chandra ki jay Pavana sutta hanu mana ki jay Umapati Mahadeva ki jai, bolo bhai sab santan ki jai. Pragata Kripala, 
Kripala means the one who's the embodiment of compassion is born. Dina Dayala. He is the support for those people who are helpless. Kausalya Hitakari. Hitakari means the one who is beneficial for Kausalya. And here, please remember that Kausalya doesn't just mean Kausalya as in a being. She symbolizes mother. All beings. All beings have come from a mother, essentially. And there's lots that is shared here. I just want to highlight some parts of this. Okay. We start with, what day was Bhagavan Rama born? Navami. On the ninth. And at what time? He was born at noon. On the ninth day of the Charitra Masa. Charitra is when spring ends and before summer begins. It's a very pleasant time. In spring, it could still be cold. Summer will be hot. So it's that in-between period. The ninth day of this in-between period, exactly at 12 o'clock, Bhagavan Rama is born. And when he was born, the sun was directly overhead of Ayodhya, or all of Bharat. They're in the same time zone. Not that they had time zones back then. And what is shared later on is that the sun stayed there for a full month. When Bhagavan Rama was born, for one masa, the sun just did not move. Stayed there. The sun was looking at Bhagavan Rama. You know, like if you really love a movie, even as the credits are going on, you're just, you just sit there. Or if you see nature, no one can move you. Nature was lost in the creator of nature. When Kausalya Ji saw Bhagavan Rama, how did Bhagavan Rama appear? As Bhagavan. You remember I told you, Dashrata Maharaj wanted to see Bhagavan Rama as his son. Kausalya Ji said she wanted to see Bhagavan Rama as Bhagavan. So he was there. You know, with dark skin, Ganeshama was mentioned. In one hand, he had a conch. In one hand, he had a mace. In one hand, he had a discus. In another hand, he had a lotus. And she was looking at him in, in awe. We would look on in, in fear. <laughs> or that discus must be worth a lot. <laughs> but she was just overwhelmed with beauty. All of our devatas are so beautiful. One of the names of Bhagavan Krishna is Manohara. They're so beautiful because our eyes are always drawn to what is beautiful, isn't it? And if your eyes are there, what's coming next? Your mind. The beauty is not the importance, it's the attraction that's important. And then when she was looking at Bhagavan in his full aura, she had also prayed to Bhagavan that, but I finally want you to become my son. And I want to enjoy like that. So he smiled at her and then Rodana, and he started crying. So he went from Bhagavan to a baby. And so you see that smile comes again. With that smile, he begins her delusion of Kosalyaji. Now here we are in our arrogance. I'm going to beat Maya. Bhagavan just has to smile and Maya will come back. Bhagavan just has to smile and for Arjuna, Maya went away. She's a servant of Bhagavan. So when I say devotion, love, surrender, this is the only way. Bhakti. And when she, he started crying, all of those midwives, all of those maidservants, they went running in every direction. They didn't know where they were going. They were just running, sharing, we have a son. And then another cry, we have two sons, then two more sons, we have four sons. And they were just running in all directions. They were telling Raja Dashrata, Raja Dashrata was inviting Vasishta Rishi. There was such celebration there. And everyone wanted to come and hold Bhagavan Rama. But Mother Koshalia was there with her Purell bottle. You know, you can't hold. You can't hold. You can't hold. <laughs> she was really giving Bhagavan Rama because she was so grateful 
all of those maidservants were able to hold them. When they held Bhagavan Rama, all they could do was close their eyes. They couldn't even look at him. And we know that too. When you see that which is so beautiful, finally you close your eyes and you feel it inside. And Rishi Vasishta was invited and Dashata Maharaj said, chant Vedic mantras, you know, let's welcome this. And he goes, Veda what? <laughs> he forgot the Veda, he forgot how to chant. And the reason for that is Bhagavan is there, Bhagavan's breath is the Veda. What does the Veda have to do with, with all of this? Everyone forgot about the world. When Bhagavan Rama was born, there was no worldliness. Now bringing this to our present lives, when your inner world is as prepared as the outer world that is described here, where people clean their homes, they clean their clothes, they only spoke positively. When our inner world is like that, that's where Bhagavan Rama will be born. But I had mentioned last week, everybody wants their to give birth to Bhagavan Rama, but are we qualified as parents to do so? Our sadhana is coming to fruition when we're just more cheerful, more patient, more accepting. You know your sadhana is manifesting. It's, it's working. And uh, I'd shared again that Bhagavan Rama was born on the ninth day. Nine is known as a Purna number. And what that means is you can play with the number nine, but it will always come to nine. Nine times one is? Nine times two? One plus eight is nine. Nine times three? Two plus seven is nine. And you go on and on and on. What day was Bhagavan Krishna born on? Ashtami, the eighth day. Eight is a number that symbolizes Maya. Eight times one is? Eight. Eight times two? One and six. It's down to seven now. Eight times three? Two and four. See, it's going down. It, and then it goes back up if you keep playing with these numbers. It's beautiful how they introduce this Vedic mathematics also. And the idea is that Bhagavan Rama is steady. I mentioned that many times. He's straight. Bhagavan Krishna is curved. Right? Like Maya keeps going around, but both of them, both of them were smiling. So for us, whatever, if Maya is at us, or if our circumstances are challenging or easy, what is your final responsibility? Smile. What is the most impractical way to live? Unhappily. The most impractical way to live is unhappily. It is not investing poorly or not going on vacations or not looking after your children. It is being unhappy. Whatever you're justifying to be unhappy, that's impractical. And so the most practical way to live is to live happily, even if you don't have whatever, but if you're happy, that's practical. This sun that stood for a month, what time did you sleep last night? What time did you sleep? 10 o'clock, 11, anyone else, 12, all incorrect. They, every person here is incorrect. And if you said a number, you're incorrect too. If you know what time it is, you're not sleeping now, are you, correct? And if you're sleeping, you don't know what time it is, isn't it? What's shown here is when Bhagavan Rama is born, that is enlightenment. There's no time, even when you are in deep contemplation. You don't know what time it is, how long time has passed. <laughs> we don't know that. We contemplate and we keep checking. <laughs> One minute, two minutes. We have our alarm set off. We can't contemplate more, more time. So that timelessness is shown. And my final thought about Bhagavan Rama's manifestation. What is my body made up of? Bones. Yeah, five elements. Bones and flesh and so on. Here, in the Doha that I read, Bhagavan Rama did not go through Bhavami. He went through Sambhavami. 
Bhavami means manifestation. Some Bhavami means he chose to be manifested. Some mean well, under his control. His body was not made up of that which is inert. Someone here said five elements. Space doesn't know space. Fire doesn't know fire. He was only made up of chit. His body was made up of light. <coughs> Awareness. What is shared here is that every pore of Bhagavan, every, every one of you look at your hands. Okay, take out your hands. <laughs> I love saying taking out, like it's locked up somewhere. Look at your hand and see if you can see the pores from where your hairs come at least. What is shared is when it comes to Bhagavan, every one of his pores is the source of a Brahmanda. Do you know what a Brahmanda is? A universe. Every one of his pores, there's a universe. And in a universe, there's 14 dimensions. This doesn't happen by accident. This is Brahman, who has come as Bhagavan. Through understanding this, we become humble. And in our full humility, we come to realize our potential. With the birth of Bhagavan Rama, all of us should realize our potential. Oh, not I.